So I'm going to drive for this whole presentation. But uh, again, th thanks for uh, for inviting uh, Arc6 to, to, to present to you and share some exciting developments with this uh, NASA field campaign that is uh, quickly broadening out and bringing in new collaborators. Uh, if you guys can't see, Meredith, if you can't see or hear me, please, I guess, say something. <laughs> but if you can, I guess, let me know too. Yeah, all good so far. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. All right, so um, putting together, you know, I like to quickly start and Sebastian's on the line, so he'll appreciate some of this, but, you know, over the, it's been it's been a, a bit of a time that it took us to put together this white paper, but it's been quite an adventure where I know we've learned a lot. Uh, we've heard a lot of discussions and gathered inputs from a, a, a across the community, really. Uh, and then, you know, we finished up the white paper uh, about two years ago now, and then headquarters moved to put it into an announcement of opportunity in Roses 2021. Uh, the science and instrument teams, some of which you'll hear from today, uh, were selected and finalized in fall 2022, so just last year. And we had our first science team meeting in January 2023, virtually, of course. Uh, we're now, uh, after all of that time, uh, moving full full steam ahead, preparing for our spring and summer deployments just next year. Uh, actually, in exactly one year from now, we will be in the field, uh, which is very exciting and stressful at the same time. <laughs> I'm sure many folks will uh, on the team would, would uh, uh, also say, but, you know, we completed our first dry one last week and we learned a lot and, and again, moving forward. So uh, ARC-6 stands for the Arctic Radiation Cloud Aerosol Surface Interaction Experiment, which is a mouthful, but we call it ARC-6 and we kind of know what that stands for. Uh, I haven't included, obviously, on this title slide, the entire team, but, you know, there is a, a, a large team of folks that are working together from the science and instrument side, modeling side, that are really making this happen. Uh, the folks I'll just call out today, Mission Science, so Sebastian, myself and Lynette Bouvier, uh, the Radiation Working Group co-chairs, Carrie Meyer and Jens Redman. We do hear from Carrie today shortly. The Cloud uh, Lifecycle Working Group, Paquita Zudaima and uh, Ann Fridlin. You'll hear from Paquita today. Aerosol Working Group chairs, Lauren Zamora and Amin Sarushin. You'll hear from Lauren. Uh, and the Surface Characterization and CIS Working Group chairs, Rachel Tilling and myself. And then uh, acknowledge our the program managers that have been helping push this arc six forward, Hal Maring and Thorsten Marcus. We do have a web page, which is shown here as a link and where you can find some more information, but we are slowly working to populate that with even more information. So uh, so without any further ado, uh, I, I wanna say that, um, you know, we know, and I'll talk about this in a bit, the Arctic is changing fast. It's in, there's, we're amidst this transition. So any data that we can get during this transition from you know, the Arctic we used to know to this new Arctic that we're moving towards, is gonna be really, really vital to understanding how the Arctic is changing, uh, what factors are driving it, and where where it's going to end up, and how fast it's going to get there, you know, and so that's where Arc Six really comes in. So Arc Six, kind of in a nutshell, uh, it's an airborne investigation that's planned for late spring summer next year, 2024. It'll be based in Thule, Greenland, uh, and these dates the, are are not exact. They, these are you know rough dates, but this these are the time periods that we will be based in Thule. Uh, the campaign is split into two three to four week segments, uh, where we, we will we will be deployed in, in Thule in May 20 through roughly June 15th, and then come back home for five weeks or so, six weeks and then go back out July 24th, August 2014. Uh, and this campaign structure and the measurements are all driven by the need to, or these three kind of objectives, to, the need to understand how coupling between radiation and sea ice properties influences summer sea ice melt, uh, understanding the processes that control the predominant Arctic cloud regimes and their properties and also radiative effects, of course, and then improve our ability to monitor all of these things from space. Arctic clouds, radiation, sea ice processes and properties. Because because we know that anytime we go out with a field campaign, you know, we can only get a snapshot. So we really need to focus on, or this mission was built on uh, trying to make sure we can improve our ability to monitor the Arctic from space. So the overarching goal of Arc 6 is to quantify the contributions of surface properties, clouds, aerosols, and precipitation to the surface radiation budget and sea ice melt, uh, specifically during the early melt season. But what you notice if you think about those those campaign or those two campaign windows that I've already mentioned is that we'll be able to see some of the changes that are happening from around melt onset uh, in in late May throughout the middle and and near the end of the sea ice melt season through you know early August. So we're really going to get these pictures of how the surface character or the surface is changing throughout much of the summer melt season next year. So a picture of of what we are kind of looking at and and deployment concept. Uh, we will be 
deployed here at the Thule Air, Air Force Base, which is uh, here in Greenland. Hopefully you can see my arrow. It's uh, in this orange box here. Uh, you see the range circles, which kind of give you an idea of how long it takes us to get to these different places. But if you see these uh, uh, blue hexagons that are shown here in this area that we're, start, we're calling the coastal corridor, which is where a lot of our operations will be, uh, these uh, hexagons mark sea ice mass balance buoys that uh, we learned recently we were able to, uh, uh, we learned recently that we're going to be able to deploy uh, next summer, probably in the April timeframe. So we'll have surface measurements of sea ice mass balance buoys out over the ice in the region that we'll be flying. Um, so the way that we'll, we'll uh, go about the campaign is we have, uh, for now, I'll just talk about two aircraft. However, we do have three aircraft actually, and uh, I kind of let maybe Paquita can talk about those when we get to the cloud section. But uh, when we were preparing for the mission, it was always a two aircraft mission. Uh, one, a low flying in-situ aircraft, which is the NASA P-3, um, and then a high flying remote sensing aircraft, uh, which is the G-3. So that's kind of the primary operations that we'll have. Um, kind of the concept here, since we're trying to quantify the surface radiation budget and the role of you know, cloud, aerosol, surface uh, properties and their interactions on the sea ice melt, has been to kind of track the sea ice parcels and the evolution of the surface in this region over the entire melt season. And obviously to do that, we're gonna need to put together both the aircraft observations, the, the available surface observations, which do include uh, some uh, ships that will uh, ships that will be in the area uh, next summer, as well as using the available surface sites that are available at Alert and uh, Station Nord, uh, and bring that together with satellite assets to be able to kind of put together the full picture of how the surface is changing throughout the year. As well as, I don't want to forget our the modeling assets, which we have uh, will have real-time numerical weather forecasts of atmospheric sea ice, Lagrangian trajectories, and also some multi-scale modeling from LES to GCM are also part of the post-campaign analysis. So I have two pictures that I uh, can use to briefly talk about the measurement capabilities here. One's more of a high level, and the one is more specific with some instrument names on it. But again, I won't have time to go into a lot of details here, but the slides will be shared so folks can go back and take a look. And also this information will be posted on our website uh, for folks to take a more detailed look at. But as I've mentioned, you know, we're we have we have this goal of characterizing the surface atmosphere cloud system in the lower troposphere. Um, as well as to be able to improve uh, satellite remote sensing. And so anytime you're trying to improve satellite remote sensing observations, uh, you kind of want to have an in-situ aircraft with a, 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 an, aircraft, an aircraft with uh, remote sensing instruments in it. And so that's what we, that's our configuration. In our high flying aircraft, we have temperature, humidity, and wind profiles via drop zones. Uh, we'll have an imager on board, which is Avers NG, which will be able to provide cloud retrievals and scene context. Uh, then we'll have the halo LIDAR, which provide vertical profiles of cloud and aerosols, uh, as well as some properties of the surface. On the low flying, uh, on the low flying aircraft, there are a lot of instruments to, that are there, probably it's too many to mention, but in general, we'll have a characterization of the aerosol microphysical properties, the meteorology, uh, the cloud microphysics and bulk properties, uh, including size distribution, CCN and INP, total, uh, total liquid water content, as well as particle images, uh, trace gases. We'll have broadband, multispectral and multi-angular radiation, including polarization. Um, and we'll have cloud properties and vertical structure, and then also sea ice properties, which include surface temperature, freeboard, uh, and melt pond fraction. Uh, I should have taken snow depth off of that because we don't have snow depth. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, a different look at this at a high level um, is, again, we have our two aircraft, which the G3 is operating as a high-flying aircraft, and the P3 is a low-flying aircraft. And again, here are the names of the instruments. What kind of skip through this one pretty quickly so that uh, we can cover some of the other stuff. But again, this is here for reference for folks that want to uh, take more detailed look later. So in developing the white paper and developing the mission, you know, we talked a lot about what the desirable characteristics of ARC-6 were. So I wanted to kind of quickly kind of mention a few things and hopefully crystallize some of the science that we are thinking about doing. And one of the desirable characteristics is really this unbiased statistically representative sampling of our region, which includes the surface as well as the clouds that are there and the radiative effects. Uh, we want to be able to characterize the surface reflectance, including its evolution 
<clears throat> which is very important for several of our science objectives, uh, be able to measure this, uh, capture the coevolution of the atmospheric conditions uh, with recurring measurements over the same sea ice flows. Also comprehensive measurements of the Arctic lower troposphere, which involves the cloud systems, both the cloud life cycle, as well as being able to uh, uh, do uh, make measurements of air mass transformation processes that, that we're able to observe as well. Uh, we wanna be able to quantify and understand the important cloud regimes and, and the cloud regimes that are important from the radiated perspective in particular. And then lastly, with our remote sensing objective, it's the evaluation and innovation of remote sensing techniques, not just to uh, you know, figure out how hard it is, again, to measure the Arctic, so we know how challenging it is, but also try to enable new ways of remote sensing in the Arctic. So before I get to the science, I want to walk through this quickly about, uh, this is how I think anyway, about you know why we need ARC-6. But and, and I probably don't need to tell everybody, but we know that the Arctic is changing fast. And this slide just kind of demonstrates all of the different ways that we know that the Arctic is changing fast. And we care that the Arctic is changing fast because these rapid changes have consequences, huge consequences for natural and human systems. But we know, and in order to inform society, we know that our models are really critical to doing that uh, and our predictions and projections of the future. But we know that our models in this region are inadequate and some would argue inadequate to inform society, whether that's considering that, uh, you know, there's a, an Arctic warming range of, of six to 12 Kelvin by the end of the century, if you look across climate models, or that there's a 50 year spread in the timing uh, uh, of the first ice-free summer uh, that's projected by across climate models. So there's a lot of uncertainties that play into that and uh, ARC-6 is designed to really get at some of these errors and one of those, uh, and to provide data to help us constrain some of these uncertainties and in models, including the representation of the surface albedo being one that I've mentioned. Uh, also model uncertainties stem from errors in the representation of clouds. Uh, the figure on the left is showing the intermodal range in cloud radiative effect that you get across contemporary climate models, these being CMIP5. Uh, the slide on the right is showing the range in uh, some differences in cloud phase and the dependencies on temperature. So both cloud radiative effect as well as cloud microphysics and phase are you know, contributing to these model uncertainties that, we, that, that are important. Model uncertainties also stem from errors in the representation of precipitation, um, including the magnitude, frequency, and phase of the precipitation, which varies, and this slide shows that it varies dramatically across different uh, meteorological reanalyses. Uh, model uncertainty also stems from errors in atmospheric state over this region. And this on the bottom left is showing, uh, or actually both of these slides are showing data from the ARISE mission, which is one uh, field campaign that ARC-6 kind of grew out of. Uh, the probability distributions of lower tropospheric temperature and humidity in reanalysis and in climate models, for that matter, really diverge from each other and from airborne observations. And as a result, we have large differences in cloud condensate. So getting some of these, uh, getting some of these co-located observations hopefully help us reduce some of these model uncertainties. Kind of lastly here uh, is that Model uncertainties also stem from challenges in observing clouds and the thermodynamic properties in space. And this is a, an example from a, a paper from Hong Chen, uh, who works closely with, with Sebastian, which is showing that you know there are some clouds when, when you, from space. It's really easy <laughs> to miss these really thin but radiatively important clouds from clouds uh, when you're observing them from space. So there's really a need to to go out and characterize these clouds so that we know what, what kind of radiation we're missing and how much energy we are missing uh, when we just look from space. So that is a backdrop. Uh, ARC-6 is, uh, again, we have this overarching objective, which is to quantify the contributions of clouds, aerosol, and precipitation to the surface summer radiation budget and ice melt. And it's been uh, separated, kind of uh, stratified into three key science question areas, uh, one around radiation, one around cloud life cycle, and then one around sea ice with this overarching also model, uh, remote sensing and modeling objective that's there. And so for the rest of this presentation, um, you'll hear from uh, these different working groups. And what you'll, you'll find out during this presentation is that in this kind of, uh, we have a remote sensing and modeling objective, but nowhere do aerosols kind of fit in, but we now have, as I mentioned in the opening slide, we do have an aerosol working group, which you'll hear from today. So, <clears throat> You know, I'll just talk about these, read to you like kind of the three high level science questions and I'll leave each of the individual working groups kind of go into a little bit more details about each of these and how they're uh, 
uh, kind of approaching these science questions and, and uh, you know, drawing up flight plans in order to allow us to advance these science questions. But from a radiation perspective, um, <clears throat> from a radiation perspective, the questions really resolve on understanding the uncertainty in satellite remote sensing observations, as well as modeling errors. And when I say modeling errors, I refer to those that are found in, uh, in, in numerical weather predictions, as well as climate models, um, which are represented here. Um, from a cloud lifecycle perspective, and I know Paquita is going to talk more about this graphic later, but this cloud life understanding, um, let me say it this way, uh, here's a conceptual picture of the Arctic low cloud lifecycle kind of as we understand it. And these key processes that are represented here schematically uh, kind of drove the design of ARC-6 and kind of represent a key hypothesis as part of our science questions. Uh, and these processes we do understand incompletely. <laughs> uh, and in or and and that kind of leads to some of these errors and uncertainties in numerical weather prediction and climate models. Um, lastly, the CI science question and kind of the key area here is, is that this science question focuses on understanding two-way interactions between the surface and the atmosphere. Um, and one of the key areas here is understanding, and let me tell you quickly, this plot that you're looking at um, is from Schroeder et al. Uh, 2014, which shows what's plotted here is mean melt pond fraction in percentage. So the areas in red show more melt ponds, the areas in green show fewer melt ponds. And this region right over here is where our coastal corridor is that we will be planning to fly during Arc 6. And one of the region, reasons that this region was selected is because it has this really sharp gradient in melt pond fraction uh, that we expect to see that will help us really better understand the role of melt ponds um, in the surface and their evolution in the surface uh, radiation budget and sea ice melt, and also provide us some very interesting scenes from a satellite remote sensing perspective as well. Uh, <clears throat> so. With that, since I know I'm over time, as co-chair of the sea ice and surface characterization working group, let me just quickly say, you know, I won't read all these to you, but one of the key things that we really want to get at that's going to be most challenging for us, that uh, it's going to be very helpful to have those sea ice mass balance buoys to do our science. But from a sea ice character, surface characterization perspective, it's really we're trying to capture the evolution, how the surface changes in time over that over the period that we're going to be uh, going to be out uh, and, and taking measurements. And so understanding that evolution and the co-evolution really between the surface and the atmosphere characteristics is really what's driving our sampling strategies and our thinking here. And um, all of these, and I have links at the end of this presentation, we can share them with Meredith to both the white paper as well as uh, the ARC-6 website that anybody who's interested can go into more detail on these individual hypotheses and our approach that we have. So with that, we can save questions to the end and I'll just go ahead and turn this over to Carrie Meyer who will be talking about the radiation remote sensing objectives. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. I see you put my slides into your format, so this is good. Um, so, yeah, just, I know we were listed as a radiation working group, but it's also radiation remote sensing. It's a pretty broad working group because it covers a lot of what arc is trying to do, clouds, aerosol, surface, et cetera. Um, but, the, but really the focus of our working group, I think the discussion so far have been on, on well, one, one of the science questions and then that remote sensing and modeling objective. Um, and just, just to rehash what, what um, Patrick already said that that first science question is the impact of the, uh, the the predominant summer Arctic cloud types on the radiative surface energy budget, and you know for this we're, we're looking to characterize the flux of the surface and cloud properties, um, and then the remote sensing modeling objective, which is just you know not only you know part of it's evaluating the current um, remote sensing algorithms, uh, the satellite remote sensing algorithms. Uh, another part of it is enhancing and, and developing new algorithms. Um, and of course, this is a very difficult region, um, as it should be no surprise to, to folks in this call, it's a difficult region for remote sensing. Oh, I'm sorry, I tried to move the slide. Patrick, go ahead and go to the yeah, next slide. Just say next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, for the radiation component, um, you know, th there's a lot of different sub-questions for this and, and, and characterizing the surface radiation budget uh, via the, the both the in-situ and remote sensing sampling of the radiative regimes. and and um, you know we're really looking at, at, at characterizing uh, the thin, low-level clouds and synoptically forced multi-layer clouds. Uh, these these two in particular are often missed or mischaracterized by passive remote sensing in particular. Um, and you know, and 
some of our strategy is, is to do coordinated flights with both the low and high flying aircraft so you can get concurrent remote sensing observations from the high flyer while the low flyer is, is, is sampling within the cloud or, or, or whatever else is in the scene. And then, and then performing systematic radiative closure flights, you know, looking at the same um, either region or, or regimes uh, throughout the campaign. Um, a big one, at least for the remote sensing side, I know uh, Patrick's already somewhat touched on this, is actually characterizing the surface. Uh, the BRDF changes uh, due to melt, precipitation, et cetera, and then how those impact cloud radio effects. Um, one of the things we were doing recently in our working group was coming up with flight plans for how to actually do this with the instrumentation that we have because we don't have uh, a, a multi-angle imager like car which has been used to do this in the past so um, I'll, sh I'll show in the next slide uh, one of the flight plans that we're, we're talking to do this but essentially we're going to be coupling the the uh, multi-angle radiometer RSP with the high flyer wide swath avarice imager uh, with, with kind of some unique well maybe not unique but some coupled flight plans there and then we really want to characterize the dominant air sources for the radio fluxes at the surface and this again is leveraging the um, airborne observations both to evaluate the satellite uh, derived fluxes and the model derived fluxes by regime go ahead and go to the next slide so this is one of the the sampling strategies that we're looking at for the surface characterization and this this requires both the low flyer p3 and the high flyer g g3 um, so in this case, we'd be trying to, to get the uh, multi-angle BRDF um, to some extent by doing this, this rosette pattern with the low flyer, which is shown in the blue track on the left. Um, and the RSP is, a, a, is an, a long track multi-angle scanner. It, it, um, I forget how many channels, but it's, it's a narrow band image or narrow band uh, radiometer. Um, and so it, it, the scanning is a long track. And so we can go at different angles at the same scene and get um, um, some portion of the BRDF. And at the same time, we'd be flying overhead with a wide swath avarice imager, um, which is a uh, considered a hyperspectral imager uh, wide swath and try to tie the multi-angle RSP with the wide swath avarice to, to say something about the surface uh, BRDF at, at a given location. And then we you know, this rosette pattern would be performed multiple times throughout a flight, so you can at least sample the solar zenith angle range as well. You can go to the next flight or next slide. Sorry. Um, and, and for the remote sensing, um, and a lot of my comments here are, are focused on passive cloud remote sensing, which is my expertise. But you know, there's a lot of other remote sensing we'll be doing. But you know, we're really looking to leverage these airborne observations to evaluate and advance the satellite algorithms. So evaluating the existing remote sensing algorithms with targeted underflights. For instance, you know, the skill of the passive cloud detection from imagers like MODIS and VIRS, multi-layer mixed phase cloud classification, which is another difficult um, task with uh, passive imagers, um, and then improving and developing algorithms that are really tailored to the Arctic. And again, improving the surface characterization, not just for the radiation budget, but this is a significant air source for uh, cloud and aerosol retrievals, and then you know, looking to improve the forward models as well as as we learn about what these clouds, uh, you know, the 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 you know the the mixed phases and the drop size distributions, et cetera, how we model these clouds, and then putting it all together to do uh, spatially and temporally dependent uh, surface radiation surface radio budget cloud radio effects. I think that's all I had. I tried to get through, through it as quick as possible. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate it. Um, Let's go to the next presentation. Uh, Lauren, I'm gonna talk about the, I'll turn it over to you. Just tell me when to uh, change the slides. Okay, great, uh, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I'm a co-lead with Armin Sarushian on the aerosol and aerosol cloud interactions working group. Um, and uh, our group is quite broad as well. Um, we have an interest, well, of course, we're gonna be using these uh, suborbital observations to better understand uh, local and transported aerosols, including marine aerosols, dust, combustion aerosols. But we also have members of our group who are, who are part of the satellite uh, community and also the modeling community. Um, and we have a wide variety of interests. Um, so for example, uh, we were interested in not only primary particles, but new particle formation over the Arctic, uh, CCN and ice nuclein particle concentrations and how they affect clouds and ultimately Again, these clouds are part are, are an important part of the radiation and sea ice um, uh, uh, processes. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so here we have a really wide variety of instruments and I haven't even gotten into the cloud uh, stuff, which I assume uh, Paquita will talk about, but these are these are some of the aerosol instruments that we have. On the high flyer, uh, as Carrie mentioned, there's a Virus, which has, for example, AOD. Uh, we also have a LIDAR, the HALO LIDAR. It uh, does aerosol backscatter and extinction, among other things. And then on the low flyer, we have a, another a bunch of instruments. Um, I don't want to read all of them, but importantly, we have real-time and filter ice nucleating particle concentrations, which are uh, really understampled, especially at high altitudes over the Arctic. Um, we have CCN. We're going to have hygroscopic growth factor. Um, we're going to have various uh, ways to determine what is the uh, chemical composition of the air mass and of the aerosols. Um, also aerosol size distribution and number concentration from a wide variety of instruments that uh, so we get a, a, a good um, uh, sp spectral distribution of, of these sizes. And then we also have aerosol optical properties from a wide variety of instruments, including a second LIDAR, the Mar Marley instrument. Um, and so just these are just some of the uh, instruments that we have. And in addition to that, we'll also, we're also coordinating with people on the ground at Willem, Thule, or I guess it's Patufix, as someone mentioned, uh, Svalbard Alert. And also there'll be ships and even potentially other aircraft in the area at the same time we've just learned last week. So, um, so we're gonna get a lot of data and it's really exciting. Um, and then on top of that, uh, being able to collaborate with all these other groups with the cloud data and the sea ice data, it's gonna be, I think, I'm really excited about it. Next slide, please. Um, so, so here are just some of the questions. I didn't get into exactly the flight plans. Um, we can talk about that more if people are interested in, but just to give people a broad idea of what topics we're interested in in our group. Um, first of all, what are the ice nucleating particles at high and low altitudes? And as I mentioned, we have actually very few high, uh, high altitude IMP data, um, especially in background summer conditions. And um, so also what are the CCN and ice nucleating particle levels over sea ice melt ponds, open ocean leads. This gets into, as Patrick was talking about, the surface conditions. Um, how does new particle formation change across the summer? Are local dust sources important in the summer? And how do transported aerosols and CCN and ice nucleating particles evolve over time? And this is all in context of the fact that we expect that aerosol conditions are gonna be, uh, we're gonna have low loading conditions, generally speaking. This is a pretty clean uh, can, uh, place if you, I mean, what I mean by clean is it's, it's hard to detect aerosols from, from spaceport instruments. Although uh, recent uh, mosaic data shows us that actually you can have high INP in background conditions. So we'll be finding more about that. But we're also interested in uh, transient aerosol events, for example, biomass burning smoke events. Um, and we, we might try to fly to those locations if they occur uh, when we're out there. Next slide, please. Uh, we're also interested in various remote sensing uh, questions and this, this um, kind of, we have some overlap with Carrie's group in this regard. Uh, we're interested in questions, for example, like, can we make it easier for satellites to detect absorbing aerosols over snow and ice? Can we make it easier for LIDAR to tell the difference between thin clouds and aerosols? And how well can the LIDAR show aerosol vertical distribution, aerosol type, and CCN and ice nucleating particle levels? Next slide. And then of course, this gets back to the main uh, way that we interact with the other groups, aerosol cloud interactions. Um, so for example, how do aerosols help drive cloud freezing? How can clouds form and become icy and stay in the sky when we know that CCN and ice nucleating particles can be quite low? And can we find signs of chemical reactions happening inside water droplets in clouds? And how important are nearby versus faraway sources of these CCN and INP? Next slide. So that's, that's about all I had. I just wanted to say that collaborators are vel very welcome. We're uh, very happy to include anyone who's interested. Uh, and if you are interested, uh, please contact me or Armin. Here are our um, emails and you can get it at the end of the presentation. Thanks. All right, thank you, Lauren. All right, Paquita. All right, uh, great, thanks. So uh, yeah, let's go to the third slide on this, which will show uh, yeah, skip ahead. So um, this is a slide that uh, Patrick showed earlier. And so what, one thing we really want to focus on is the whole evolution of the um, cloud from its you know, nascent development through its dissipation at the end. So we have a, a strong interest in um, looking at uh, either Lagrangian um, sampling or ways to constrain uh, 
process modeling studies of um, in a Lagrangian framework. And uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so we have three planes and the P3 and the Gulf Stream have been mentioned, but we're also, we'll also be able to use a Canadian uh, Learjet that has, um, you know, you know state-of-the-art cloud microphysical probes and a, a precipitation radar on it. it has a pretty short range it can only fly for about three hours um, it's only outfitted with the cloud probes so that gives it a very um, single-minded uh, you know purpose which is uh, kind of nice for with the you know just thinking about flight plans that um, there's a little less to um, synergize with with the other with other goals, and it, it, it's also nice in that we have two planes that have basically the same set of cloud um, in situ probes on them. So we can what what we're thinking of is that the Learjet can be upstream of where the P three is sampling, and and that way we just get a, a longer um, range. You know, we can sample more of the whole uh, cloud life cycle that way. So, um, yeah, in our meetings, we've been talking about flight plans for this. Um, you can show the next slide. That will be my last. Um, we've mostly been thinking about that area north of Greenland so far. Um, that So that part has, um, we think, will be characterized more by thin single layer clouds, mixed phase over sea ice and polinias and the melt ponds. And, um, we've uh, come up with some ideas on how we can use the three planes together. And um, you know, another region that we expect we'll go to is the Fram Strait, which will have more liquid water path, multi-layer clouds, open ocean, the marginal ice zone. Um, and we, we still need to do more discussions on um, how best to sample those and whether, you know, maybe we want to come at it from Swalbart rather than from the Pitufix uh, Tule base um, to get at those. So, yeah, we just had the our first dry run last week. So there's still, um, it's, it's still in a nice stage where there's still a lot of ideas floating around and, um, and, and more to do on how to um, synergize everything. So that, that's it for me. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Paquita. Before I have one more slide to wrap it up, but before one other, uh, before I move from the slide, uh, one of the things I think is really interesting to think about that came up at last week's dry run that I think is definitely going to be uh, sort of a really interesting, ask, be an interesting part of Arc 6, which is, you know, we are now planning, thinking about flights in the Baffin Bay. There's some really interesting surface conditions and high gra uh, surface gradients that, that happen there. Um, so that provides a, a, a really interesting contrast with some of what we'll see north, uh, north of Greenland. So that is something that we've just recently started talking about that, that seems like it'll be very interesting. Uh, and also, it's also like right at the doorstep of, of uh, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, Pitfu Pitufik. If I said that right, I hope I said it close anyway. But that was just one other thing that we are thinking that came out of just out of some discussions last week. So before I close and we go to um, the discussion section, I want to say, since I Sebastian said it last week a bunch, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say it as well, and I forgot to say it in the beginning, which is, you know, on our the, the ARC-6 aircraft, we have a lot of different LIDARs. <laughs> For using the LIDARs that are on the plane, we can measure sea ice freeboard, we can measure cloud aerosol properties, we can measure temperature, humidity, and wind profiles. We have this really unique mix of remote sensing instruments, particularly LIDARs, that can characterize a lot of the atmospheric properties. And so that's a really unique aspect of ARC-6 that we're still trying to figure out what we can potentially do with. And, uh, and so that's, that's a really exciting aspect of ARC-6. So, Again, our goals uh, for today's meeting were really to share with, with you all the current state of ARC-6, our thinking, um, in order to both ask you to be kind of, to go out and, and tell the rest of the community that, hey, ARC-6 is happening next summer and we're, you know, looking for collaborators and opportunities, you know, both, both to help, you know, do collaborations now, but also trying to get, uh, 
folks ready to use our data when it's available, right? And getting the word out about, about the campaign. So that's one of the asks that I have here, but you know, I have as a takeaway, what should you go tell your neighbor? Uh, and that is, what is ARC-6? We're, we're an airborne investigation. It's planned for next year, based in uh, uh, Northern Greenland. Uh, and it's driven by the need to understand how coupling between the atmosphere and surface influence energy flows and ultimately sea ice. And again, that involves the clouds and the aerosols. Uh, as well. So why ARC-6? The Arctic is changing fast. We know that it has implications, broad implications for human and natural systems within and outside of the Arctic. So collecting and analyzing this data helps to advance our understanding uh, of the factors that influence sea ice loss and enable some better predictions, decisions, and hopefully improving you know, everybody's lives through that going forward and adapting to climate change. So with that, we can have discussion and questions. Um, you know, here are the emails. I just shared the emails of the folks that were either talking today or had already put them here instead of the entire team. Uh, but we do have the Arc6 website here that lists everybody on the team and all of the instruments are on the one page of the website. And also there's a link here to our white paper uh, here as well. So with that, I'll stop talking and take any questions. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thanks everybody for this really nice overview. I Hope that my internet hangs on. It should, uh, but we've got some time here for questions and discussion. And Patrick, I really appreciate that you, you have this slide at the end that kind of put some take home messages on there and uh, allows people to think about, you know, where this might go and, and how they might connect. So I think that's one of the primary things that we're hoping to do through these Arabic discussions is build collaborations and find natural points of overlap. Um, I see a couple hands up, so let's go to those hands. Uh, Matt, I saw your hand first, so go ahead, please. All right. Um, hope my uh, volume's good here, Patrick and everybody else. Nice presentation. Great to hear some details. Um, I was really interested in um, the ice mass balance buoys. Is that something that you guys are deploying as part of ARC-6 or is some other collaborating entity deploying those so um so i'm going to say yes and no uh this was this is a collaboration between arc 6 and isat 2 to fund them the buoys will be actually placed out there uh we're working with chris poloshinsky at dartmouth to put those out there uh the current this is actually a new development uh that we've been able to uh been able to fund that project so the the goal or the idea is to put them out from both alert and station nord uh within 200 nautical miles of the coast sometime in uh april next april before the the mission takes place okay i i, I think that those are super important for the goals uh, i mean i assume that you've looked at data from those before and it's it's really awesome to really understand how all this atmosphere radiation forcing all this stuff how that imparts itself on the sea ice. It's like, if you want to understand sea ice, you have to have that. So one comment I would have then is in the di in your diagram, all of those were really close to the Canadian coast there or the archipelago in the old thick ice. And I would encourage you all to try to get some further out where you have thinner ice and get it into some of the, you know, the kind of first year ice or I guess that's see in April. Yeah, you should be able to get some first year ice. So I would encourage some of that because that's going to be um, an important difference between that that kind of ice and okay. the old thick ice that's piled up there along the Canadian coast. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that note away. That'll be something we'll have to negotiate with Chris from a logistics perspective and, and that <laughs> stuff. But yeah, I agree. It's It would be very scientifically beneficial to do that. And just, I guess, I didn't say any more details about them, but you're just uh, about the buoys. They're going to have kind of the typical measurements that CIS mass balance buoys do with shortwave radiation. And four of the buoys will have um, uh, snow pingers. So we'll have some snow depth information on like four of the, right now we understand there will be 10 plus or minus two. You know, so somewhere between eight and, and 12 or so. And four of those should have the snow depth information. So that's going to be really important for us laying down the baseline of what the surface looked like before melt really starts taking hold and what the snow was before, yeah, sort of started melting. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Matt. Um, Jack, go ahead, please. Yeah, I thought for sure Matt was going to bring this up and I was almost ready to lower my hand, but uh, 
there's it seems to me to be a, a lawful lot of overlap between what you guys are trying to do and what the germans have been doing for quite a while now and that was a big part of mosaic but there's a consortium what's the acronym is ac cubed that's been studying a lot of these same questions and i think some of your team has good relations with them but i'm wondering as a group have you been talking to them and thinking about how they've tackled some of these same challenges and whether you can avoid reinventing the wheel by talking with them more closely and matt is i think a central player in that whole effort he might have comments on it as well i'm happy to talk to this but if hold on cheating the truth all right sebastian's not on right now so the answer to that question is yes we've been talking to the folks from ac3 uh, uh manfred in particular um he's actually i guess a collaborator on the team you know and and we've been working on working with them in particular based on what they've learned from ac3 the one plot i pulled in that's on the radiation slides is from manfred um so we've been using their uh trying to work in their flight planning tools and we're definitely in discussions with them about lessons learned um and inc incorporating you know what we can i don't know i know um L lauren you've been talking with some of the external collaborations trying to organize that i don't know if there's something you want to add in particular um, well, well, I mean, I, yeah, we've I've had I've had conversations with various people involved in that uh, campaign um, to some extent, not as much as Sebastian has. Um, and then we're also working with the ground stations at, at in the area. So that's uh, some of them. Will, I think there's going to be an aircraft campaign just before us in April at uh, at Station Nord, and um, so we're speaking with them about that. And also, like I mentioned, various ground stations. There's going to be a couple of ships that are going to be out there at the same time as us, including the Polarstern. But I think they're going to be a slow, slightly different location. And um, also the Odin. Um, and I think a Norwegian vessel as well. And then, uh, but yeah, I mean, we could we could certainly benefit with more conversations with the Mosaic Group in particular. So Matt, if you want to if you want to be more involved, you're welcome. Well, I guess I was going to say, if there are other things going on, there might be synergy. You know, you mentioned the ship-based observation campaign that's in a different place than you're going to go. Well, you don't know exactly where you have to go, so you might want to go where the boat is. Yeah. Well, well, they're really far away. <laughs> yeah, we go. <laughs> we won't go that they're far. A bit, they're a little bit farther than our range of aircraft. But, uh, but that is going to be right under us, so, so we can collaborate with them, and we've been speaking with them. Um, and I think the the Kron Prince something or another, I can't remember, it's a Norwegian vessel is um, going to be generally in our area as well. I think they do have a major plans for stuff in uh, off of Nord, at Nord and around Nord. Matt, yes. correct me if I'm wrong, about the same time as you, or maybe just before. I think just before, but we're, we're speaking with them also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, well, you know, building off of that from, from Jack, you know, the AC3 program, um, I'm sure that most of y'all know about the, the hollow AC3 campaign that was um, last year. And that approach to doing kind of this quasi Lagrangian observing is just amazing, right? I mean, it's really, um, you know, Paquita, you spoke to that about, you know, some Lagrangian perspective on clouds and it's really hard, of course, to build up any kind of statistics, but that some of the tools that they developed for that, I think would be really beneficial for your flight planning and then for how you kind of do your cycle pattern on, you know, from one flight to the next, or even how you design the individual flights so that you can kind of optimize some of the, the potential for Lagrangian perspectives, even just having a couple of transects through an air mass in a, a quasi Lagrangian sense will be amazing for supporting things like LES modeling. Yeah, in fact, for um, and Paquita, I, you can you can say something when I'm done here. But in fact, we planned a whole Lagrangian like flight, uh, well, back to back flights last week at our dry run. So that's de something we're definitely thinking about and trying to enable. Um, and we are, uh, I I would say we're we're trying to get our hands on the tool, but we have the tool that they use for those Lagrangians. Just trying to make sure we understand how to use it our flight planning folks know how to use it so so we're working with them on that um and so that is definitely something we're doing i don't know if Pahiti, you want to add anything to that on the air mass uh trajectory front uh yeah just that i think they they had an easier situation than than we're going to encounter um like in the dry run you know we we did look at a nice air mass pattern that was wrapping around northeast greenland but the you know there's so many different air masses that are abutting each other that have totally different trajectories. 
Whereas what the AC3 people were encountering was more, you know, coming off of the Arctic sea ice edge and flowing towards the south. So in anyway, it, it, the Lagrangian um, ambition is going to be, it, it, it's it's a great goal. And um, I, but I do think it's going to be a little more challenging. But yeah, having their tools and learning how to work with them, um, learning from their experience will help us also. Yeah. Okay, great. I think I think this is really good discussion. Clearly, looking for opportunities to to learn from what we've already done, and and also um, try to fill in holes. And I think the team did a really nice job of describing all the stuff that that is being brought to the table by NASA. But I wonder if you have any comments about things that you wish you had that you don't, that you'd really like to have, where where other people might be able to contribute or step in, given that there's still a little bit of time, maybe to to sneak some stuff in there. Well, fluxes, yeah, fluxes would be great to have. And I just sent an email to Shidong about the sail drones, but maybe you can help with that too, because I hear Noah is thinking of having a uh, sail drone campaign in the Arctic next summer. So if they could do it somewhere where we're also flying, that would be very nice. Patrick? <laughs> I'm sure you um, have some thoughts too. <laughs> Well, I do. Well, so my big missing thing was the CS mass balance buoys. And so I got that. So I'm kind of happy at the moment because <laughs> that just broke like a week or so ago that we managed to get make that happen after a roller coaster of thinking we had it and then we didn't have it and then we had it again. So um, I uh, I guess the, from the airplane perspective, so I know that we don't really have it's hard because I know what we would want, but I don't know if we necessarily have room for it particularly, but more radar capabilities. <laughs> so we would want, at least from the air, but I don't, Lauren, did you want to speak to anything else you might need from the surface? Because I know we talked um, a bit about that last week from an aerosol perspective. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, more modelers would be helpful, I think. Uh, oh, that's true. Yeah. Well, um, maybe, um, well I, I have one other thing, um, more drop sons, right? Because we've talked oh. about doing those drops on circles that they also did in AC3 to get advective fluxes and different, you know, uh, people are on op different sides of that because there's trade-offs with those. I, that, and this is a place I would love to learn what the AC3, what they have learned from their drops on circles. Like, can we rely on era five to give us the advective fluxes or, or not? I, I don't, I don't actually know. So if anybody has an opinion or. Um... Probably not. Well, what, one other thing <laughs> we could certainly use is uh, a LIDAR at alert on the surface. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's a right. huge Excellent. thing. And we don't have that. Yeah. But that's we're hopefully going to get a CML there. But uh, at this point, we don't have a LIDAR there. And that would that would just be a big, big thing. Yeah, that's right. And actually, LIDARs in general over the. <laughs> That would be helpful, but especially at alert. Um, Akita, to your question about the circles, um, I assume you know Roll Neggers. Um, he's his team's kind of the head on that, and they've been doing some of their calculations of divergence across those um, circles. And so, uh, you know, a little communication with him would probably go a long way in understanding the potential that those kinds of patterns would have for you guys. Yeah, that's right. He was going to do a presentation and then he got the flu, but for for the ARCSIC community, um, I'll get in touch with him again and reschedule that because, yeah, you're right. He would be the perfect person to speak to it. One thing that I understand is is a challenge uh, is is predicting where clouds are going to be. That kind of came up during our dry run, and that's also been mentioned by previous campaigns before us as, as a difficult thing. Um, so that that is it. That just as a community in general it would be. I mean, that's part of why we're doing this, and that's. But I mean, being able to model the clouds better would also help us sample better. Now, one thing I don't think that we necessarily mentioned that is going to be a challenge is for some of our objectives, we actually need clear sky. <laughs> Finding it can sometimes be hard, especially for those radiation BRDF patterns and some of the uh, CI surface characterization using the, the Elvis uh, LIDAR. So uh, that's not an, well, some clear sky would be an ask that, that we, nobody here can deliver, but. <laughs> 
I mean, this this kind of brings up a really good point, of course, which is the the really the strong importance of the, the forecasting that goes along with all of this. And of course, the aircraft team will have a forecasting group. But yeah. um, have you been connecting with any of the weather services or other other teams that might be providing routine products for for that part of the world uh, in terms of the Danes or or other other groups? That's that's a great question. I know that. So Amy Solomon has been heading up kind of the forecasting for Arc 6 using her CAF system um, and bringing in some other data products. I know she mentioned to me last week that they're going to she's going to be able to bring in ECMWF, but I don't know about any of the other uh, any of the Danish forecasting capabilities. And we also talked about trying to bring in um, so in, in in the spirit of learning from also other NASA campaigns, the Ice Bridge campaign, uh, you know, they did a lot of this flying and then they really wanted clear sky. They found the Canadian models actually kind of one of the best for 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 clouds. So we're working on bringing that in as well. But the Danish isn't one that we've thought, talked about, but we definitely should. See, there's a hand, Santiago, or comment on this one. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, you got. Uh, oh, the microphone was on. Uh, yeah. Sorry. This is Santiago. Uh, Couple of questions. Uh, I was just wondering if the campaign is going to be happening a year from now. Do you guys have a contingency in terms of whether if there's going to be uh, wildfires like we have right now in Alberta? I mean, they could perfectly be there at the same time this year. I mean, and are you guys discussing the priorities on how to proceed? I mean, right now the the aerosol signal over Greenland is fantastic. So having the campaign happening, is, it would be unique from the aerosol viewpoint, but I know there are other objectives. So are you guys already talking about how we, are we gonna, the operating procedure on how to prioritize things if you have this gigantic aerosol signal? And second, yeah, and second, you can, this, what is the, southernmost range of aircraft uh, deployment because there are a number of uh, mining uh, initiatives in the, I think at the west coast of uh, Greenland right now. I don't know how far south you're going, which is effectively a, a dust source right now, mining. And, and, and that's being discussed in other settings, uh, you know, all the, for environmental reasons. So I wonder if you guys have the range to reach those places. So on the first question, um, last week in our discussions of what to do in the case of wildfires did definitely, thank you, Paquita, uh, definitely came up and was discussed. Um, in terms of prioritizing uh, what we fly when we fly, we do have a decision tree um, that we might have to update a little bit with uh, some of the, the, you know, what if a really big uh, burning uh, fire event happens again and, and will we fly it? But, you know, in response to that, because that had that wasn't really something we thought much about, I would say, in the white paper planning. But, you know, part of the reason why we ended up flying over Baffin Bay uh, in last week's dry run and developing a flight plan for it was kind of with that in mind as, as part of part of that. So we are thinking about it. Uh, However, just as a as a note, you know, in our uh, decision tree, kind of one of the, the the top priority really is is clear sky and getting the surface radiation, uh, surface characterization, BRDFs, because we don't expect to see much of it. So, in terms of priority, I know that's one higher on the priority list, as as are some of these you know tr uh, big transport events. So, um, we are. I know it's a long answer, and it's not probably specific as specific as you would like, but we are thinking about it, and we are working on that. Um, as for our southern range, you know, I think that's a question we have to bring back to the team and discuss because we haven't talked probably at all about flying south. <laughs> uh, if we we are, you know, our domain is we've been focusing on our science is focusing on the evolution of the sea ice and surface properties north of Greenland. And so, you know, that's what we've been focusing on to this point. So that hasn't flying south over any of the sites or any of those locations that you mentioned, Santiago, hasn't been anything we've discussed to this point. Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thanks, Patrick and everybody. We, we're running out of time here. Uh, in fact, we're minus one <laughs> on the time clock. So I, 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 I'm gonna wrap things up, but I really appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the time taken to give some overviews and information on how the campaign is moving forward. And I uh, encourage everybody to think about whether there may be other resources that we should be thinking about when it comes to ARC-6. 
So thanks again for everybody to everybody for being here. Thanks again for participating in the discussion. Uh, the community practice will have meetings or planning to have practices or meetings in June and July uh, focused on uh, warm air intrusions, I believe, in July and um, some modeling work in connection with the HILAT project in June, although we have to confirm speakers for that. So we hope to see many of you back uh, later this summer. But for the time being, uh, thanks again, and I uh, hope you all have a great rest of the rest of the week. Appreciate you joining us. Yep. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for discussion. Cheers. Yep. Thank you. Bye.